Okay. Lisa, if you would like to start, we can go ahead. Okay. I would like to, uh, my name is Lisa Mangili. I'm the Executive Director at the History of Diving Museum. I'd like to thank all of our people who are watching our Zoom presentation tonight, as well as those of you who end up watching it later on a recording. And feel free, that even if you watch it tonight, that you share it with your friends. Oh, there's Michael. Um, <laughs> Hi, Michael. Uh, share it with your other friends as well. So a lot of things have been happening at the History of Diving Museum. We're real excited. We just had a great uh, alligator lighthouse swim weekend. We had a pop-up exhibit in the, uh, the library and a lot of people that came into town for it. It's an annual event and it helps raise money for our local aquatic activities down in the Keys. So that was a nice collaboration for us uh, tonight. Uh, our sponsor is Easy Storage, and they're going to be talking, their local uh, proceeds from Easy Storage help with uh, things with the, the museum. So thank you very much, Easy Storage in Isla Mirada. We also have our featured exhibit, 15 Years of the Diving Museum, that will be open through December 31st. So we invite you, if you're in town, to come and check that out while it's still up and uh, on display. Our speaker next month is going to be Chris Dutton, who is on our board. He actually used to work at the museum as a young um, employee intern when we were building out some of the exhibits. So it's nice that he has now gone through college. He's a successful attorney up in Clearwater, and he's going to be talking next month about that 15-year transition, about acquiring the building and what the Bowers did to get their collection. And it, it should be really entertaining, both from a personal perspective, because he lived a lot of it, and from a historical perspective on um, our records and how we've grown. So, you know, a lot of times when people come into the museum, they ask, or they say they've been here before. So we usually ask, oh, that's great, how long? So we can tell them all the different things that have changed since the time that they, they're back again. So it uh, always something new, always something fresh. And those changing exhibits are also going to be real exciting. We're doing a uh, our fiscal year end is this month. And we're reaching out to our members, giving them all an update of what's happened over the last fiscal year. If you're not a member, I strongly encourage you to become a member. It really helps sustain the educational outreach, things like the uh, changing exhibits and the pop-up exhibits and the uh, immerse yourself programs and if you're already a member invite somebody if every member invited one buddy one family member one friend uh, it would really help out with the uh, core foundation of uh, of what we're doing and uh, help us out financially so we welcome our members Tonight we have John Hazelbaker, who I knew for years before I ever started working at the History of Diving Museum. He's a in the Commercial Diving Hall of Fame. He's been on the board at the History of Diving Museum um, since I've known him. I'm, he'll tell you exactly how many years. But tonight he's going to bring talking to us about the cachalot, which is the very first saturation uh, diving unit that was used by commercial divers. It's of historical significance in the commercial diving um, community and as well uh, for the history of diving museums. So with no further ado, I will hand it back over to Emily. She's going to talk to us about the technical issues and then John will start on his presentation. So welcome. All right. So let me get back on here just so you guys can all see me. So just a little um, general housekeeping for the presentation. If you have any questions for John at any point in time, what you are going to do is actually send them to me through the chat feature. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll come back to them and I will field them to John. Um, this just kind of keeps things moving in a nice um, manner. And plus with the virtual questions, you know, we can't, we can't do the raising hands and such. So if you have a question at any point in time, message it to me through the chat feature, which if you just hover above the lower section of your um, screen, there should be a little um, image that says chat and it will come to me. And also for those who are just coming in and stuff, 
I do have everyone muted and cameras off. It also just kind of helps with streamlining, streamlining this for filming and such too. So without further ado, I am going to now um, hand this over to John. So let me, all right, John. So what we're gonna do is just like we did earlier. <laughs> so if you can hover over the bottom of your screen to do the green share screen button. Okay. And then you'll be able to open up the PowerPoint. All right. All right. Can, you see that? Can everybody see that? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's going to answer. Yeah, like you see it. <laughs> yes, I can see everybody it. So I'm assuming it. everyone else is. So we're good to go. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, um, uh, thank you, Emily. And thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Again, my name is John Hazelbaker. I have a, a consulting firm, commercial diving consulting firm, uh, Hammerhead Marine Services. And uh, 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 as the name implies, or byline implies, I do consulting work for the commercial diving industry. Based on my, uh, I've been doing that for about 22 years, based on my 31 some years as a uh, commercial hard hat diver and owner of a commercial diving firm, an inland commercial diving firm. And I'll talk more about uh, that here in a minute. I'm also an HDM board member and have been for a number of years. I've lost track, so uh, pretty much since they've had a board. Uh, but uh, and uh, I've enjoyed that and and honored to be a member of the board and uh, <clears throat> help <clears throat> and assist in all the wonderful things that this museum does uh, for our community and basically uh, for the diving uh, industry. I call this. I tell everybody in the uh, a commercial diving industry that I work with that, hey, you've got to support this museum. It's, it, uh, it is a custodian of our heritage. So, um, and with that, I want to, uh, my talk tonight is on uh, saturation diving, but basically the cash lot saturation diving system, as Lisa said, was the absolute very first saturation diving system to be utilized on a commercial diving project. And, and Actually, it's even more famed than that because it was used, the very first commercial diving saturation project was an inland, a U.S. inland diving project uh, that I will talk about a little bit later uh, on Smith Mountain Dam. Uh, but the cash lot system, and that was done in 1965, the, uh, the cash lot system was also used because of its great success on that project was brought into the Gulf of Mexico and was actually the very first saturation diving system uh, to be used in the Gulf of Mexico as well. And I'm going to talk uh, uh, about saturation diving. I'm going to talk about other saturation diving habitats. And I'm going to uh, 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 talk explicitly about those projects and the man behind the project uh, uh, particularly. I, I've got this little inset picture and I, I put this in here. Uh, just to, uh, because we're talking about the cash lot. This is actually the cash lot superimposed uh, next to the museum because we have been able with the help of the, uh, 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 the man behind the cash lot, uh, a man named George Wiswell, and because uh, of a, another very good friend of mine and, and a business associate, Jim Caldwell, who now owns his saturation system, we didn't know until George Wiswell actually uh, 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 visited the museum that this cash lot still existed. Uh, but it's still in existence. Many of these old systems have been scrapped uh, uh, despite their historical significance. And so the museum has been able to uh, uh, procure this and secure this. We have an exclusive right to it. We're just waiting on two things, permits to come in from the county or from the city and uh, uh, for funding. Uh, but uh, as we go through here, we'll talk about this, but this is a concept drawing of, of basically how this system would look. This is the original colors that it was painted and how this would look alongside a museum. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, now, <coughs> to, uh, uh oh. <laughs> you should be able there to, we there we go. There we go. Now, now. <laughs> yeah, my keys weren't working. There we go. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I did, but I'm, I'm showing you these pictures here. Uh, this is uh, uh, the gear that I wore back in the 60s, and this project was from the late 60s. 
And this is a trash rack repair project that we're working on. I show you this because this was the same project for a similar power plant uh, 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 that the cash lot was first used on. And these steel sections here are what we call trash racks. These are uh, uh, steel racks uh, and they're actually steel bars uh, about a half inch thick and three, inch, uh, and, and three inches wide. And uh, in this case, about 45 feet long and they stretch up above uh, to the top of this uh, 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 structure on the side of the power plant, which is called the intake structure down to the bottom, which is about 30 feet underwater. Uh, the only difference between this project that I'm working on, which uh, was replacement of all the trash racks and the support structures on, on this uh, powerhouse, and we had uh, oh, about eight or 10 units like this. We spent several months on this project uh, replacing the support structure, which are actually H beams uh, 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 that span across uh, uh, the opening and then the trash racks that attach to those H beams. Basically from a fabrication and an installation standpoint, it's a, a, a pretty standard job. It's just that it's on the Ohio, this one was on the Ohio River and uh, uh, it's underwater. Uh, the cash lot was uh, 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 Smith Mountain Dam project was much more uh, intense because it was down to as much as 220 feet of water. Uh, these are some other uh, of my working pictures. This is another trash rack repair project. And this is very, very similar to the Smith Mountain Dam project. And this is one uh, that my comp company uh, was a successful bidder and contractor for the same owner, American Electric Power, that owns Smith Mountain Dam. <clears throat> and here uh, you can see this project took us a while. We worked right through the winter uh, on it. Uh, and this is one reason that these trash racks need to be fixed and repaired. In this situation, ice got on the trash racks, debris, and they kept pumping um, and uh, caused a differential pressure that caused all the trash racks to collapse and all the support structure uh, to be damaged. So we had to go in and cut out, salvage all the trash racks, uh, all the support structure, and then replace it with new fabricated material that you see stockpiled over here. So. Again, this is very similar uh, to that project. And uh, uh, <clears throat> here you see one of the, I, I bought a newer hard hat uh, later on in my career. And this hard hat uh, uh, is on display here at the museum. Uh, <clears throat> now, the difference between the projects that I worked uh, on inland and the uh, cachalot and project was that uh, it was in deeper water using mixed gas, and uh, they use saturation diving. So I'm going to do a little, or just a uh, maybe not so brief uh, intro or kind of a tutorial on exactly what saturation diving is. I assume that most of our watchers here are, are pretty much diving oriented, but um, uh, so they understand the requirement for decompression. Uh, but saturation diving is a, a little bit different animal, uh, but involves the same uh, you know, physiological principles. And that's that your body under pressure, uh, uh, you're breathing a mixture of inert gas and O2, which is a, a metabolized, but the inert gas, either the helium or the nitrogen or a combination of the two uh, are inert and they're absorbed in the bloodstream and the tissues. Uh, so the longer you're down at any given depth, you have to make a slower ascent to be able to off gas that inert gas uh, uh, and breathe that out. Uh, and so you have what, uh, what we call stage decompression. Saturation diving is, uh, and this was a theory that really wasn't uh, well developed until sometime in the 30s, uh, uh, is at the point that <clears throat> you're down at a certain depth when your body will, set, will absorb no more nitrogen. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, and that's what we call your, your tissues are totally saturated. So the theory behind that is, well, if, if that's the case, then we could leave the, that diver down there for a longer period of time and not, uh, uh, and not have any more uh, decompression obligation. So, uh, and it took about 20 years, uh, which I'll show you in the timeline here for that to, 
uh, happen. Now, I'm going to talk about what happens on a satur uh, commercial saturation diving project. And it's a little different the way the scientific community does that. And I'll, I'll explain that difference here as we go along. Uh, but the saturation divers live in a saturation complex, which is pressurized environment on the surface of uh, the vessel of barge. The scientific community puts that pressurized environment on the bottom. Uh, and they try to establish a uh, living quarters and the, uh, the crew living on the bottom. Just doesn't work in the commercial world. Uh, the saturation complex is decompressed only once after the project has been completed or after a 30 day time period. So now we're leaving divers uh, in under pressure at let's say at 300 or 600 feet for a 30 day time period. Now that's a 30 day working time period. They still need about two days to get down to depth and, uh, and then several days to surface from that depth to do their decompression. But in the meantime, they have 30 clear working days where they can work around the clock without being encumbered with any decompression obligation whatsoever. So that's the whole theory and practice behind saturation diving. Um, and you'll see, uh, especially with these two projects we're gonna talk about, just how uh, uh, effective that, 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 that saturation technique is uh, for productivity in the commercial world. Uh, so <clears throat> transfer to the pressurized uh, 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 or the deck decompression uh, chamber uh, is done by the uh, means of pressurized bell. And I'll kind of show you the layout right here. Uh, if you're, this is a plan view. This is looking down at what a modern saturation diving complex would look like. Not quite what the cash thought looks like, but this is a modern saturation diving complex. You have your main de deck decompression chamber, DDC. That's where the divers live 24-7. Uh, that's where they live. It's divided in compartments. They have sleeping quarters. They have a galley. They've got showers. Uh, they've got a head uh, and so, uh, or a toilet for those may not be marine oriented. Uh, that, uh, so all of their, all their bodily functions and their comfort uh, as much as it is, uh, is sustained inside the DDC. And then we have what we call a transfer capsule. Uh, and this is where the divers lock out of the DDC into the transfer capsule. And this is where they, they get ready to enter the PDC or uh, in the 60s, this was called an SDC, submersible decompression unit. But basically this is the bell. And can you all, uh, Emily, can you see my uh, uh, cursor all right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I can now, see it. Now back in the 60s, this wasn't required, but this is a requirement on all saturation diving projects now. And this is what they call a rescue chamber or uh, an HRC, which is a hyperbaric rescue chamber. And this is in an emergency. Let's say the barge is sinking, barge is on fire, what have you. Uh, everything goes wrong with the DDC. They can get into the rescue chamber. It can be, it can be uh, uh, unlocked from the rest of the complex a lot of times they put this on rail, they have it on flotation, or it can be swung over to another vessel. And you have, they have a minimum of 72 hours of breathing gas uh, uh, in the rescue chamber so they can be decompressed remotely. Uh, now, in the left-hand side, you see a picture of the bell. It's a bell being lowered. You'll see some of the high pressure gas on the side. It's a requirement. It was practiced back in the 60s and it's a requirement to this day that they have a minimum of 48 hours of emergency breathing gas. So if anything that you see, this is the, what we call the umbilical. You've got a lift line coming down. That's a cable that, lo that lowers it through this uh, A-frame or from a, a crane. And then you have an umbilical that, that's, that <clears throat> uh, feeds all the supplies that the divers need. Uh, their breathing gas, uh, <clears throat> their primary breathing gas, uh, their uh, hot water for their hot water suits. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, all the communications cables, TV cables, uh, all of that. Uh, you may have hydraulic power coming down to, high, to power the hydraulic tools that they use. Uh, or, uh, uh, and almost all the tools are hydraulic anymore. So all of these members are incorporated into the umbilical. And generally this umbilical is about uh, three inches to four inches in diameter. So it's, uh, 
by Pemberson. So that's your layout of a modern day uh, saturation diving complex. So here's a little history on saturation diving. Uh, in 1938, Dr. Edgar N. and Max Noe made the first uh, intentional saturation diving uh, dive by uh, spending 27 hours at about 100 feet of uh, seawater uh, in, in a simulated uh, situation. They were in a county emergency hospital recompression facility in Milwaukee. But this was actually recorded as, uh, as the first actual satur successful saturation dive uh, that was conducted and early on in 38. Then we jumped to 1957. This is kind of a milestone timeline uh, in the saturation diving world. And in 1957, Dr. George Baum began the Genesis Project. Now, Dr. Bond, uh, he was a Navy commander and he was doing this uh, uh, Genesis project for the Navy. Uh, he was also a medical doctor, had his own practice, and he was also a preacher. He's a very devout person, often quoted scripture to his dive crews. Uh, and Genesis, uh, in Genesis, uh, they mention uh, of man's dominion over the creatures in the sea. And so this is, uh, and, and this was his <coughs> whole focus and uh, his dream is to be able to develop a system whereby uh, man could live and work on the ocean bottom uh, uh, unconstrained by decompression obligations. So uh, that's what he worked on for a number of years. And this was a forerunner to the Sea Lab projects. So the US Navy Sea Lab projects. And uh, I'll give you some detail on that. Uh, then we jump to 1965. Uh, and that's the first commercial saturation divers were uh, dives were performed by George Wiswell's firm, Marine Contracting from Southport, Connecticut, utilizing the cash line. At that time, it was a four-man saturation diving system um, uh, built and actually acquired by Westinghouse. Uh, and the project was to replace trash racks, which I showed you earlier, uh, at about 200 feet of fresh water on the Smith Mountain Dam, Virginia. Uh, then we jumped to 1981 and uh, Dr. Peter Bennett uh, uh, conducted the Atlantis III experiment, pressurizing the volunteers, uh, dive volunteers to 2,250 feet of fresh uh, uh, seawater. Uh, and then slowly decompressing the atmospheric pressure over a 31 day period. Now, so that is really uh, in 81, we have not gone any deeper than 2,250 feet. In fact, as I'm going to show you, uh, and it really proved to not be practical. There was just too many other uh, uh, issues with saturating divers to that, uh, to that depth. Um, so uh, operating procedures. Uh, saturating divers are allowed to live and work uh, typical beyond the air diving limits of 190 feet of seawater. In the commercial world, 190 feet is as deep as you can do surface dives on air. And <clears throat> that's for safety reasons and for practical reasons. Uh, but for long, uh, uh, so for long projects, the, uh, the money, uh, there's <clears throat> the saturation diving can save money due to the reclamation of helium and oxygen, which is very expensive. It also increases diver safety. So, <clears throat> After the end water work, the divers return to the pressurized uh, uh, complex, which is located on the diving support barge vessel uh, oil platform, or in the case of our first project on the face of the dam. Uh, typical projects over 300 feet in at least 14 days will be conducted by a saturation diving. Actually now, it's actually a requirement that they do saturation diving for any dives deeper than 300 feet. The duration is not Critical. That's a business decision, an economic decision on uh, 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 for shallower depths. Uh, and there is, because of the nature of the project, saturation diving done today in as, as little as 150 feet of water. Just depends on the complexity of the project and uh, you know the economics and the and the business decision made by the contractor. Uh, excursions to greater depths will require decompression, returning to storage depth. Storage depth is a depth that we keep the, uh, keep the divers pressurized at. For instance, I was, on a, uh, I was a lead consultant on a uh, project, hatch diving project in upstate New York, New York. 
an inland diving project. The uh, depth of the shaft, this was a shaft for the New York uh, DEP, Department of Environmental Protections, uh, and the New York Water Department. This was a shaft that led to their main water tunnel, 14 foot tunnel that runs, uh, a 14 foot diameter tunnel that runs about 1400 feet underground at the deepest point. Uh, and the shaft, uh, one, of the, one of the shafts uh, to this tunnel was about 715 feet deep. And some of the work was at 715 feet. The bulk of the work was at 675, but we stored the divers under pressure on a 24 hour basis at 600 feet. Uh, so they were allowed to make excursions down to this 675 without incurring any more decompression uh, obligation. And they could have made shallower excursions as well. Uh, and this, uh, on that project, that wasn't necessary, but that's what the uh, excursions made. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that. And uh, uh, <clears throat> here we've got, uh, here we got, the, you see the interior of a bell. Now this is taken with a fisheye lens uh, or a very wide angle lens, but it shows you how tight it can be in the bell. Now you can imagine the size of the bell when we did the job in New York, that shaft diameter was 13 feet. So we had to get a bell and all of the emergency gas supply uh, that is mounted around the exterior of the bell, as you see in this picture to the left, uh, in this 13 foot shaft and still have clearance to ride up and down without getting fouled. Uh, and so uh, you, can, you can picture, uh, and like the cash lot, the bell was eight foot high and five feet in diameter. That does not give you a lot of room to put all the umbilicals that you see hanging here, the diver's helmets, uh, the radios, uh, the tools, and whatnot. But here you see a diver, the, the, uh, the lockout hatch uh, is already in the open position. He's sitting down on the hatch, ready to be hatted and ready to go to work. Uh, this, in this case, this is a two-man dive crew and saturation diving is done with either two or three-man dive crew. So in this same size bell, you may have a third man in here as well and a third set of umbilicals and, and helmet. So uh, while this diver goes to work, the diver's sitting in the hatch, this diver will tend him and also act as his standby diver, uh, should that be necessary. So here you see a picture of the bell being lowered uh, through the water column or uh, to the water, surface of the water. And here you see it being lowered through the water column. Uh, diver locks out at the bottom of the bell, and this is what we call the clump weight uh, hanging from the bottom of the bell. Uh, and that <clears throat> normally is a clump weight. You'll see normally there's two guide wires too. This keeps it from spinning. And then the clump weight uh, is a weight that can be released so the bell becomes buoyant in uh, an emergency situation. It also will hold the diver's tools. So in this case, you see the diver down here is probably collecting his tools, and then he may be stationed. 10, 15 feet away from the work and, and probably uh, uh, 15, 20 to 30 feet over the bottom, just depending on the sea state and that type of thing. Uh, and then he will leave, he will leave his uh, station, uh, the clump weight and go to his work area. So, and this is how saturation diving is done today. And basically how it was done on that first dive in 1965. <clears throat> Depths, uh, so saturation diving, uh, just a summary, depths to a thousand feet. Thousand feet is a practical working depth that uh, uh, saturation diving has done today. They've done it deeper, it can be done deeper, uh, but uh, the practical limits are a thousand feet and anything deeper than that is usually done by work, what they call work class ROVs. Uh, standby surface require when the bell leaves the surface until the bell uh, returns to the uh, saturation uh, uh, complex. Our project in New York, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that. The second diver must be in the bell to assist and tend a diver in the water and act as a standby diver at the bell. Uh, <clears throat> in certain situations, like our project in New York, uh, where we had penetrations that had to be made uh, 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 from a side tunnel that went from the shaft to the major tunnel, uh, then we had to have a three-man crew and two divers in the water, one acting as a tender at the entrance to the uh, uh, was uh, the uh, horizontal tunnel. Uh, and divers must carry an emergency gas supply. We call them bailout, uh, bailout supply. And at depths greater than 500 feet of seawater, uh, a rebreather, secondary life support, what they call the SLS, 
uh, system is usually worn uh, instead of uh, 280 cubic foot cylinders. Uh, in a commercial world, a 50 cubic foot cylinder is usually the standard size of a bailout bottle that a diver wears, required on every dive, regardless of the depth. If he's diving in five feet of water, he has to have a bailout bottle that provides him a minimum of a four minute supply at depth. Well, <clears throat> even 280 cubic foot cylinders, uh, uh, the secondary life support system will usually supply 30 to a minute to an hour of uh, even at 500 or even at a thousand feet of seawater. But if you use a pair of 20, uh, 80 cubic foot cylinders, that's not going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, our job in New York, they wanted to use twin 80s and that was just minimal for that 600 foot, uh, 675 foot dive uh, and really wasn't adequate because of the penetrations that were being made. So uh, uh, they wore twin 100s. Uh, they couldn't use the SLS because the, the bell was smaller and the hatch size was smaller and they couldn't get this out through the hatch. Uh, the twin uh, 100 cubic foot cylinders, they staged in the tool basket and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, installed those or put those on once he jumped down to the tool basket outside of the bell. Uh, thermal protection, exposure protection is required. And the only thing that works at diving to those depths is hot water suits. Hot water suits is a norm. And uh, as you'll see here, uh, <clears throat> the man who uh, conceived and operated the cachalot for these two projects was also the first man uh, to uh, use, uh, uh, to develop and patent the hot water diving suit. Uh, uh, secondary means for recovering the bell is required. So you've got to have a secondary winch, secondary umbilical. In our case uh, in New York, uh, <clears throat> because of the, uh, the tight constraints and the depth, we had a secondary bell. Uh, and a secondary crew, saturation dive crew, to go down and rescue that bell if, if it had become foul. So, um, typical manning levels. This is for a 24 hour operation, so this includes two crews. This mounts to about 43 people. Uh, so, it's, uh, uh, it, it's <clears throat> labor intensive to run, and uh, all these, all these uh, individuals have to be highly trained for this work. So our project in uh, New York, we had a 28 man crew per shift. Uh, advantages on limited bottom time. Uh, and that's that, that bottom time is all productive bottom time uh, other than the travel time. Depths to a thousand feet, controlled decompression, minimized number of divers required for long projects. If you're trying to do this with surface divers, you'd be, whereas you could have six divers in sat uh, to do all of the work, you'd have to have 20 some divers in order to do this, uh, uh, the same kind of projects, uh, uh, even in uh, two to 300 foot of water. So, uh, uh, so it minimize the numbers of divers and you're able to reclaim, they have reclaim uh, uh, HEO2, uh, which uh, drastically reduces the expense. In other words, uh, part of that umbilical is an exhaust hose. So they're exhausting and they're actually pumping by vacuum that exhausted gas uh, uh, to the surface and they're scrubbing it just like a huge rebreather. They're scrubbing the carbon dioxide, adding O2 and repressurizing it and then reusing it for the, for the project. Uh, you have a very controlled environment because uh, uh, the divers are only transferring to the job site in the bell and they're stored uh, on a 24 hour basis on the surface where they can be monitored uh, and, and fed and communicated with easily. Disadvantages, very expensive to mobilize, highly technical skills required, highly technical equipment required, uh, considerable maintenance of the system required, large footprint, uh, diver commitment requirements. In other words, the divers got to have all their, their personal life pretty much all squared away for a 30 to 45 day period. Uh, for when I say a 30, a uh, typical sat dot job will last 30 to 35 days. You add on to that two days for compression uh, to compress down to depth. And then one day for every 100 feet plus a day is a rule of thumb for decompression. So that 600 foot dive took eight days for them to decompress. So there's, there's a, 30, <clears throat> a 30 day dive is actually 40 days that you're away from your family 
uh, your friends and all your other personal commitments. So uh, large crew requirements, as I showed you earlier, and difficulty addressing injuries and illness of pressurized divers. You got a diver, if something, if a, a serious injury happens, you either ha then have to lock in a, 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 a doctor or a surgeon, uh, and there's not many available that are willing to do that or capable of doing that. Uh, on, on, on most project, our projects, uh, it's, requ it's a requirement to have a DMT. In New York, we had a DMT for each dive crew, each bell crew. So, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> a finite gas supply, in other words, availability of HEO2. It's becoming scarcer all the time. That's why reclam reclamation of HEO2 is critical. It's not a requirement, but it's practiced by almost every saturation diving contractor. Uh, so some demographics, the average uh, age of a saturation diver is 44 years old. Uh, this age has gone up over the years, but this is basically a requirement because these divers, these saturation divers are the cream of the crop. Uh, these are divers that have proven themselves uh, time and again on difficult surface diving, uh, both air and, and mixed gas diving jobs, and are, have been proven to do the task. Once they get in sat, uh, you know, that's not the place to learn their trade. They have to know it when they get there and they have to have proven themselves. So that's, that's why that age is up there. Um, and the average rate, uh, day rate for a saturation diver, it's probably curious to most people, what do they get paid? Uh, it's basically uh, today $800 to $1,000 a day. <clears throat> uh, is, this is funny, but that's the same rate that they were making in the 70s when saturation diving really became pre uh, uh, prevalent and especially in the Gulf of Mexico. Saturation divers, because they were a rare breed and the work was just coming up, they were making $1,000 a day back then. Our project in New York, all the divers uh, in SAT were making $2,500 a day. Uh, and that was because it was a union project. And that was what the, uh, uh, that was a negotiated rate for that project. So uh, currently saturation divers will, will work, uh, work a maximum of 180 days a year. Uh, and that's kind of the norm for a competent uh, uh, commercial diver, 180, and we, uh, that's wet days a year. That's days that they're actually getting in the water and getting paid uh, a diver pay. Uh, and, and that includes some surface diving because uh, a, a company that a diver's working for may not have back-to-back -back, uh, uh, saturation diving jobs, but they'll, they'll put their better guys on the surface jobs as well. Um, and all set your day projects will have at least two working class ROVs to work in tandem with the divers. So um, this, this is how uh, the commercial diving industry conducts saturation diving today. Uh, and I can tell you, it's not much different. The, satu the saturation diving complex are a little more technical. Uh, they're a little bigger. Uh, they have better depth rating than the cash slot system, but all the techniques are practically the same that George Wiswell uh, conceived and practiced back in 1965. Um, uh, now, how is that different from the scientific world? I'm going to just show you uh, a few uh, uh, saturation diving habitats that have been, uh, that are, uh, in fact, we had an exhibit here in our traveling exhibit room of many of these uh, uh, habitats. And I think a lot of the uh, world that uh, uh, people that in, a, in a recreational and scientific diving community, this is what they recognize as saturation diving, is where they're putting men on the bottom. And that was the original concept. Uh, and besides George Vaughn, uh, Jacques Cousteau, they were, they were kind of in competition in a way, but they also shared information. But uh, uh, he was very active and enjoyed uh, a hell of a lot more funding than Dr. Bond did and the U.S. Navy uh, 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 procured for their for their sea lab. But uh, uh, Cousteau ran two projects, uh, well, he ran several uh, uh, saturation diving projects, but the first one was Con Shelf 1 uh, in 1962. He was a little ahead of the curve. Uh, but those two divers at a depth of thir uh, 33 feet for two weeks. Then he ran Con Shelf uh, 2 the next year. He did Con Shelf 
two was a mission at 36 and 82 uh, feet. They were on a ledge. And so they hung a smaller habitat. This is one of the habitats I used. Uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, it was really quite luxurious uh, uh, what he had there. But their whole concept at that time was let's colonize men on the bottom. Let's get this perfected to where we can uh, keep people on the bottom to be productive, aquaculture and scientific research and that type of thing. That was a, that was a dream and it's really never come into fruition. Uh, then we jump uh, to the next saturation diving project uh, of note was the Sea Lab project and Sea Lab 1. Uh, and I show you this picture here because this is a Sea Lab as it sits today. Sea Lab 1 um, was procured uh, and uh, gifted to the Man in the Sea Museum as one of their outside exhibits. And uh, this is, uh, in my mind, uh, they have several outdoor exhibits, and of course they've got a museum, which I don't think is quite equal to ours by far, but uh, uh, this outside exhibit, uh, they've got it interactive where you, uh, uh, the uh, uh, attendees can actually go through the exhibit and they've got the, uh, and they go through the sea lab and see how the divers uh, actually lived and worked uh, inside the chamber. So, uh, uh, I think this is one of their, uh, uh, probably the best exhibit and the most attraction that that museum enjoys today. Um, that's why I'm so anxious to procure this cash lot for, uh, uh, for the history of diving museum here. So this project director was Dr. George Bond, who we talked about, he's often referred to, and this is worldwide as a father of saturation diving from all the work that he did on the Genesis project in the 50s. Uh, sea Lab 1 was uh, deployed in 193 feet of water uh, off uh, southwest of 27 nautical miles southwest of Bermuda in July of 1964. The four-man crew used mostly the U.S. Navy Mark VI uh, mixed gas rebreather for their outside excursions, and <clears throat> uh, which were limited to one atmosphere in either direction. This is the first time they've really experimented with being able to excur excursion depths and, and uh, and as well as decompression times. Uh, all the Sea Lab projects, and I'm going to talk about two and three here, but all the Sea Lab projects were plagued with problems and issues. And a lot of that had to do with funding. They had very little funding. This is at the time uh, of the space race. And all the funding and attention and news attention was all going to the space race at this time. Sea Lab got very little recognition. Um, uh, <clears throat> very little respect at the time. Uh, in fact, all the counterweights that they had to use to counter, uh, counterweight this in 193 feet of water were like truck axles that the divers went out and procured from junkyards and that type of thing. That's, that's, that's the budget that they were under at the time. Uh, <clears throat> the mission was scheduled for 21 days, but cut short to 10 days due to an approaching hurricane. And they had, they were plagued with problems. The Sea Lab uh, flooded a couple times. It had to be uh, uh, picked, it had to be picked out of the water and dried out and that type of thing. But, uh, and also their decompression time. Uh, it was based on three foot per hour ascent rate. Uh, a, a little quicker than we do today. Uh, about 55 hours total decompression time required. Uh, sea Lab 2. Sea Lab 2 uh, went the next year uh, in 1965. Uh, again, the project director was Dr. George Baum. Um, and he did this in partnership, or the Navy did this in partnership with Scripps Institute of Technology. This was deployed in 200, uh, 205 feet of seawater, uh, one nautical mile offshore in La Jolla, California, uh, which is where Scripps was uh, located. In fact, they had a uh, a, a, a communications cable ran out, ran out there and uh, to the to the sea lab, uh, <clears throat> to the uh, complex uh, that uh, uh, so the the students and the and uh, all the uh, <clears throat> manpower involved with the project could communicate directly uh, with the uh, uh, with the aquanauts. Uh, Three separate dive team uh, missions were led by astronaut Scott Carpenter. Scott Carpenter was actually procured uh, because of this funding issue 
and recognition issue. The Navy uh, uh, taught Nassau and the letting them have Scott Carpenter. Uh, and he was, a, he was an avid diver and anxious to be involved. Uh, he was actually involved in Sea Lab 1, but he got hurt in a motorcycle, recreational motorcycle accident just before they deployed and he had to be scrubbed from the mission. But, uh, uh, and <clears throat> but by the time Sea Lab 2 came around, he had healed and he was actually involved and ran a dive cruise on the first two, two missions. Sea Lab 2 was 10 times the size of Sea Lab 1 or seven times uh, the size and had enjoyed 10 times the budget of Sea Lab 1. Uh, mission was scheduled for 45 days. Scott Carpenter spent 30 and then Navy Master Diver Bob Sheets led the third team for an additional 15 day mission. Uh, the decompression time was based on six foot per hour. They really tried to ramp that up uh, and it did not work out. They bent, uh, they bent a diver. In fact, Bob Sheets himself got bent. Uh, and they had to spend a lot more time uh, uh, doing treatment to the diver, had they use a slower rate. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> Sea Lab 3. Sea Lab 3 was pretty much a disaster. Project director, they took, uh, 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 they brought in uh, Commander Blackjack Tomsky, uh, and there's reasons that became known probably 23 later. Uh, 20 or 30 years later, why uh, he was uh, put in charge. Dr. Bond was still involved, but he was uh, the medical director uh, instead of the, uh, the project director. Uh, sea Lab 3 was deployed in 610 feet of water near San Clemente Item, and it enjoyed five times the budget of Sea Lab 2. Sea Lab 3 was plagued with problems, including glass leaks, in inadequate thermal protection for the divers. Uh, mostly uh, due to the increase of the depth of the mission, uh, but also because they were using the hot water suits provided by Wiswell, which worked fine, but the Navy just didn't have the appropriate pumps to get the water down to 610 feet, the hot water heap it, heated. So the divers suffered greatly from hydro, uh, hypothermia uh, and uh, other problems that I'll get to here. Uh, <clears throat> and there was only one ma uh, four man mission it was led by Navy diver Bob Bart, uh, who was a uh, noted he was involved in all the Sea Lab projects, uh, just a prolific diver, an experimental diving unit diver for the Navy, and it was also inducted in the Commercial Diving Hall of Fame for all of his contributions to mixed gas and saturation diving. Uh, they were utilizing the Mark 9 rebreather, which also presented uh, uh, problems. In fact, uh, the mission was scheduled for 60 days, but caught drastically court because of the death and that, uh, of aquanaut Barry Cannon. And uh, Barry Cannon attempt was attributed to a malfunction of the Mark 9 rebreather. Basically, it was a problem with the, the CO2 scrubber, uh, and it took years for them to really figure out and, and, and try to uh, pinpoint the exact problem with that unit. The mission was also rumored to be a training mission. Uh, and this didn't come out for 20 or 30 years. It's probably a topic for another uh, talk. It's very interesting. But Sea Lab 3 was really deemed for a while to be an unsuccessful mission and kind of almost a black eye. Uh, and, you know, they lost a diver on it. But uh, uh, actually, uh, it turned out that it was a training mission. Uh, <clears throat> And this is still, as a rumor, nobody's ever admitted it, but mission rumored to be a cover for the Ru Russian communication cable tapping project off the submarine USS Halibut. And uh, just briefly, the Halibut was uh, a submarine that uh, conducted operations in Russia, in a Russian field uh, in 600 feet of water, coincidentally. And uh, they had uh, a disguise, uh, <coughs> Uh, SUV, submersible underwater vehicle that they they called it, but it was actually a, ha uh, uh, a saturation diving complex uh, on the deck of the submarine. So the sub actually uh, mobilized in 600 feet of water. They had saturation divers go out and tap the Russian cable. And uh, so many people think now that this is exactly why Sea Lab was conceived in the first place. So in that regard, uh, it was a very successful mission. Now, some other sat scientific saturation diving 
uh, projects around the world. I'll just briefly mention, I've got to mention Tektite, uh, but uh, uh, Tektite uh, 1 and 2, uh, uh, both successful. I think the, the fame of Tektite 2 conducted the first ever all-female dive team led by Dr. So Sylvia Earle. So uh, they, this was owned and operated by General Electric Corporation, uh, deployed in about 43 feet of water, and these, these uh, 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 <coughs> missions uh, were done in 1969 and 1970, all from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, <coughs> this is the last uh, scientific I'm going to talk about because it's the last operating undersea saturation diving facilitated uh, facility dedicated to scientific research and uh, astronaut training. And a lot of you already know about it. Uh, it's kind of the key, one of the keys, uh, 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 claims to fame, I say, uh, called Aquarius Reef Bay. Uh, this uh, uh, system was built for NOAA in 1986 uh, for 5.5 million, uh, much more than what Sea Lab 1 enjoyed and deployed off of St. Croix. Uh, it's an 82-ton pressure vessel, 43 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, three main compartments. Uh, missions are normally seven to 14 days, but a 31-day mission was conducted in 2013, and uh, the museum participated in that by, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, we kind of partnered on that by sharing communications with them and, and having them uh, uh, have presentations here at the museum. Uh, the habitat was moved to the Florida Keys in 93, sitting in 65 feet of water at Conk Reef between Key Largo and Isla Mirada. It's now owned and funded by Florida International University since 2014. But I think the, the main thing is, is that it's operating basically on a daily basis and uh, it's the last scientific diving facility operated. And again, their whole concept is uh, uh, men living on the ocean bottom men and women living on the ocean bottom. This brings us to the cachalot system. So <clears throat> cachalot system, this is how it looks today. This is the main system. Um, and as I said, it was the first system to utilize an inland commercial diving project in 1965, and the first saturation diving system to be used on an offshore diving project in the Gulf of Mexico in 1966. Uh, I, it makes this system uh, historically significant, and I'm going to run through some of the specs on it. Uh, it was a four-man system. It was later increased to be a six-man system. That means six mans can live in uh, uh, live live under pressure uh, at the storage depth uh, for <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and split up their working crews in either two to three-man crews and be deployed to the belt. This is the main decompression chamber. It's made for three compartments. Uh, you know, you've got your uh, living compartment, uh, dining compartment, and workbenches. Uh, you've got showers, you've got head, and you've really got all the facilities that the men need to live. They lock out of this and they lock into the belt. This is 27 feet long, uh, seven feet in diameter, and weighs 37,000 pounds. The SDC, or what we now call the PTC or belt, is eight foot high, five feet weight, uh, five feet wide and weighs about uh, <clears throat> 8,000 pounds. Uh, and it normally would have all the emergency gas around the perimeter, uh, perimeter of it stowed, as you see here. This is a picture of the bell actually on the Smith Mountain Dam project. And this is a picture uh, of the diver. Now he normally would not be outside the bell except at depth. This is for photographic, uh, 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 you know, purposes here. But uh, again, if you look at the diver, he was outfitted with a rebreather system run through a Desco mask, modified Desco mask, and here's his hot water suit. Uh, so the divers are fitted with a Desco Jack Brown full face mask. We have these on display in the uh, commercial uh, uh, in the commercial display. Uh, uh, the system was conceived by George Wiswell, designed and built by the J.F.H. Emerson Company. Westinghouse takes the credit for that because they acquired the J.H. Emerson Company. Uh, but it was already conceived and, 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 and pretty much constructed at the time of their acquisition. And the design and construction was overseen by Jerry uh, O'Neill and Alan Krasberg, both 
Hall, uh, Commercial Diving Hall of Fame recipients. They also worked on both of these projects, both the Smith Mountain Dam project and the um, uh, <coughs> uh, Gulf Oil project. Uh, and they actually made dives in these, but they were the troubleshooters. They were the ones that kept this system up and running. Uh, 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 the, the suit that you see here was a Weswell Hydrotherm hot water suits that uh, keep the divers warm and functionally efficiently in the 40 degree water temps that were encountered at the depths uh, on both projects. And uh, there's one thing is a 40 degree water temperature, but the other thing is the fact that you're breathing uh, helium, which is a much lighter gas than, than, uh, than nitrogen, and it whisks the body heat away uh, eight to ten times faster than nitrogen does. So uh, uh, keeping that uh, divers warm is absolutely imperative, and the only practical way to do it is with uh, utilizing the hot water suits. And this was, this was the innovative things that George Wiswell did back in the 60s, and it's still done this way today. So about George Wiswell, uh, uh, he was uh, a, a professional engineer and CEO of marine contracting. I believe he started a marine contracting company in 62. So it wasn't long before he was up and running with his cash lot system uh, and took on this uh, uh, <clears throat> first of a project. Uh, he holds 13 engineering patents, uh, primarily related to underwater work, one for the hydrothome hot water suit. Uh, and he maintained that patent for many, many years. Uh, and AKA, the, uh, it was also called the Wiswell suit and, and several for underwater epoxy coatings and piling encapsulation techniques uh, that he used in his inland work uh, and which is a real mainstay, especially on the East Coast and West Coast for many inland commercial diving firms is uh, uh, rehabilitating uh, uh, war piling and uh, that type of thing, both steel and, and timber and concrete. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he's known, conducted the first inland commercial saturation diving project for Appalachian Power, which is a division of American Electric Power, one of the nation's biggest power companies at Smith Mountain Dam, Virginia. He conducted the first offshore commercial diving saturation diving project for Gulf Oil Cor uh, Corporation in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm going to give you specifics of both those jobs, uh, both those projects. He was named the Engineering News Record. Uh, that was a Construction magazine that's still in uh, publication today, uh, but he was he was named their Man of the Year in 1966, and which uh, that award's considered a constructive industries award of excellence, for, and he won that for the pioneering and the concept of commercial saturation diving. Uh, <clears throat> he was then in, in 2016 he was inducted in the ADCI Commercial Diving Hall of Fame uh, for his numerous and significant contributions to the practice of commercial diving. I was able to uh, be at that uh, induction ceremony and uh, uh, <clears throat> sat with George and, and, his, and his family members. And uh, uh, that was the first time I had had the pleasure of meeting him. But uh, the next day, Lisa, uh, our executive director of the museum, also met him and talked with him. And then uh, a few days later, he visited the museum and he spent two days here. And this is when we first learned that the cash lot system was still in existence and able to be procured. So, but uh, George was a real dr driver and shaker uh, in, in the commercial diving industry all the way from the 60s to the, uh, to the mid 90s. Uh, I'm very grateful for the fact that he got his, in the Hall of Fame in 2016. He was, he was uh, 90 some years old and uh, it, uh, he, but he, uh, I'm glad he was able to get that award before he passed about a year later. So my tribute to George Westbrook. Um, here's Smith Mountain Dam. I'll give you, a, I know we're running short of time, but I want to go through these projects. I think they're very interesting projects, at least from a commercial divers uh, standpoint. Smith Mountain Dam, uh, uh, in existence today, it was constructed in 60 to 63. Uh, it, was, it was constructed as a dam that form the Smith Mountain Lake behind it. Uh, Smith Mountain Lake has a depth of 250 feet of fresh water. It's designated as a pump storage hydroelectric facility. In other words, it has five hydroelectric units that where they run water and they use a pressure differential from the 250 feet upstream of the dam 
by running it through the trash racks and the turbines and then the pen stocks and the water exits into the river down below 250 feet below. It's that differential pressure that drives the turbines and generates the electricity. By pump storage, we mean they run this, <coughs> the generators uh, in, in the upstream to downstream direction during the peak hours of demand. In lower hours demand at night uh, or in, in, in cooler rainy weather, they may reverse the pumps and they actually pump the water back into Smith Mountain Lake up through the same, uh, the, the same penstocks, the same turbines and back through the trash racks. Uh, the problem <coughs> that caused the need for this project is when these trash racks were installed and designed that they were installed to withstand a differential pressure of 250 feet ahead being pumped from the upstream to downstream direction but they weren't designed to withstand the pumping pressures from the downstream to upstream direction and they became damaged. So the damaged ones had to be removed and uh, <coughs> re-engineered and reinstalled. And that, can, uh, that was the work that George Wiswell's firm marine contracting uh, did with the Castle diving system. So I'll show you some particulars on it. Uh, here's the, the facts. Now, <clears throat> here's another thing that I really admire George and his company and his people for in that uh, this, this, this is owned by American Electric Power. American Electric Power probably has the, the strictest uh, 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 dive uh, <clears throat> uh, qualification criteria of any power company or really any client, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, uh, other than some of the uh, get oil and gas uh, firms. Uh, and for them to <clears throat> allow this project to take place using an innovative technique, George Wiswell had to be a hell of a salesman and also really put his neck on the line. He put all his personal assets on the line. They were, this project was designed to do with surface divers and it was estimated it would take well over a year to complete all the repair work using surface divers. Uh, so the project facts, a trash rack replaced the depth from 90 feet to 220 feet, a saturated four-man dive crew five days a week for about 40 working days. They completed this successfully and safely in 40 working days over this year, uh, year time. So the way they did it, they had two uh, uh, two two-man dive teams, but the two-man dive teams are lowered. Uh, here's the chamber. You can't see it real well. I, I've got a schematic that'll show you better. Here's the chamber being lowered. The divers live in this complex. They lock into the chamber two at a time. You've got four men here. Two of them go into the chamber for their first shift. Uh, and they're lowered down to the working depth. They lock out of the bell and they go to work. Uh, <clears throat> when they're near the shift, they run about four hour shifts per diver uh, and get back in the bell. They come back in, they lock into the main chamber uh, and they switch places with the next two divers. Uh, he was a, uh, ran this a little different. He ran his four-man dive crew for five days, working days, spent two days to decompress, uh, and <clears throat> then he gave those divers a week off. He was afraid of burning out divers. That's not really practice today. That's the way he did it. It worked successfully. Then he, so he had, uh, he had really an eight-man dive crew, and so when the one dive crew was off, the next four-man dive crew would come on. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think I've covered everything there. Process claimed to save at least one year of repair time over conventional surface supply diving operations. So this was such a successful, uh, here's, a, <clears throat> here's a schematic, that's what I was looking for here. Here's a schematic, here's the, here's the cash lot deck decompression chamber, here's the bell being lowered, uh, here's the dive shack and all the dive, the gas racks uh, where the dive supervisors and the, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, rack technicians, uh, gas rack technicians work. Here's all their stored uh, HEO2 mix, pre all pre-mixed uh, and <clears throat> gets pumped down uh, into the chamber and, and through the umbilical down to the bell. This is their dive barge where they house tooling and, and the hot water systems, hot water pumps and systems. 
So this project was so successful and uh, it got such notoriety that Gulf Oil then contacted Wiswell about performing uh, uh, using his crews and the cash lot system to come to the Gulf of Mexico. Very unusual for an inland dive contractor to be, uh, there was all, also Gulf of Mexico firms, but nobody had, had, had done saturation diving yet successfully. So they <coughs> contracted with him and the very next year, uh, he came to the Gulf of Mexico, brought his system, brought his crews and uh, performed the, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, this this project uh, uh, project location was about 30 nautical miles southwest of Louisiana uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in 235 feet of seawater uh, and the project contained uh, <coughs> uh, the project consisted uh, of basically a salvage project and a plug and abandoning of the oil well project they had 16 oil wells that were being drilled from two different platforms and the platforms collapsed uh, during Hurricane Betsy. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the project was to uh, go down and salvage all of that steel uh, and then get and so they could get to the wells. If you can imagine 16 wells in the bottom and two platforms that extend at 235 feet, all that steel is required to have a platform, all of that collapsing on top of the, uh, of the wells. All of that uh, all of that seal had to be scrapped and, sa and salvaged and it had to be burnt. They used explosives, they used uh, 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 <clears throat> underwater burning uh, techniques, uh, and of course it contained heavy lift rigging. Over here in the corner, you can see their thousand ton, uh, uh, that had to be a thousand ton crane capable of making 250 ton lifts uh, uh, <clears throat> over the side of the barge. You see a smaller crane that was just simply used for handling the diver's gear and lowering the belt uh, up and down to the work area. Uh, the working platform was a J. Ray McDermott Dairy Bar number eight, a 300 foot long by 80 foot wide ocean going barge. Uh, and it's actually a floating city. I've worked on these barges, uh, uh, lay barges 300 foot uh, long. And uh, the one I worked on could house all the living quarters and, and uh, uh, galleys and workshops and everything is below decks. Uh, it's really a prolific, a floating city. Uh, the one I worked on uh, contained 197 guys uh, at one time working around the clock. Uh, <clears throat> so this was a significant project and again, done successfully uh, using, utilizing the cash lot diving system. So that pretty much brings us to uh, the end of the talk. Uh, I, as I said earlier, uh, we've got some concept drawings uh, uh, of uh, situating the cash lot system. A lot of work has to be done to, uh, to move utilities and to prepare the ground and uh, the tie downs and uh, restraints that are needed to uh, 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 legally install this system next to our building. Uh, and the only thing that's stopping us right now is funding. Funding and of course the permits. Uh, uh, so, uh, but we're working on this. And uh, this is another concept of where we'd like to restore the cash lot to its original colors and then eventually be able to open it up and restore the inside to uh, what uh, uh, would have been used at the time that it was used in the 60s. So uh, uh, I just ask all of you, if you think this would make a, a great display here at our muse museum, that you, uh, uh, that you render your support by way of assisting with funding uh, and uh, uh, but basically by letting everybody know, let the employees know, let Lisa know, let our founder, Dr. Sally Bauer, uh, know that you think that this would be a great addition to our museum. So uh, and with that, I'll open it up to questions. Sorry, I went a little bit over, but I had a lot of material to cover there. So. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take this off so it'll be both of us. Okay. So I've got lots of questions, John. <laughs> uh oh, uh -oh. That's, well, that's but good. I and know. Somebody it's, was listening anyway. 
there's there's a there's a lot of good questions. Um, and this was from early on. What you you several times you referred to a trash rack. What is a trash rack? Uh, a trash rack. Well, that's why I tried to explain on those early pictures of the project I was on. A trash rack is basically just a steel grading system, steel bars that are installed on the up the outer face of a water control structure. So, uh, and this all this does is keep trash from the outside deb and debris from being sucked into the pumps. And normally they'll have a big trash rack system on the outside. And for instance, the project I was working on is very similar. The trash racks are very similar to the Smith Mountain Dam project. Those bars are like a half inch thick. They're, they're steel bars, they're like four inches wide. And, uh, you know, the sections are usually, well, they're different size sections, but, you know, as much as 20 or 30 foot tall. Uh, and they're, they're welded together in sections. And, and those sections may be two, four foot wide. And then they're installed side by side to fill an opening that is required for the water to come in into the turbines. Now, many of these trash racks may have a, then a, a smaller or a finer uh, uh, screening system behind it. We call them basket screens that are rotating screens so that the finer, the finer stuff that goes through the, the thickness of the bars then get picked up by the rotating screens. It just depends on what the pumps can handle. So those rotating screens then will rotate and they've got ledges on them and they're at an angle so that the debris gets carried to the surface and it gets washed off into a trough and then downstream to a collection pond or an agency or in the old days, just discharge down river. So I hope that answered your question. If not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, the next one is from Randy. Um, he finds this super fascinating because he relates a lot of saturation diving to activities in space. Just to get a handle on the cost, do the nature of the highly specialized equipment coupled with highly trained individuals, is there a basic ballpark rule of thumb in terms of dollar cost per hour of a typical operation? Oh, uh, boy, that's a tough one. That's a tough <laughs> one. Yeah. Oh, let me put it this way. Uh, you look at a 43-man crew, and uh, most of those guys are going to be getting paid between three and $1,000 a day. So you get an idea of what the labor cost uh, would be uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, uh, usually, the, a saturation diving complex, uh, uh, most of the companies are proprietary what they charge. Uh, but uh, like on our New York project, that was, uh, that was in phases but uh, that was probably a 20 to $30 million project. A saturation system alone, uh, <clears throat> let's say 10 years ago, was costing about $5 million. Uh, they're probably closer to 8 to $10 million now just for a saturation diving complex, including a reclaim system and all. So that's just basic rule of thumb. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I know a little bit of this from the museum. Um, are there women in saturation diving? I know you talked about Sylvia Earle, you know, being an early female pioneer, but in today's commercial diving world, you know, do you have an idea of how many, you know, females are in the field? Yeah, I, I, and, and there are. And in fact, on our New York project, we had two women. We had a, a woman on each crew. And uh, uh, there are, there's not a lot. I think it's probably less than 3%. So, um, so. Uh, but there are women in the field and, and, you know, they usually have to work their way up just like the men do, uh, starting uh, as, uh, you know, uh, divers tenders and, and graduating to a diver, graduating to a surface diver, graduating to a mixed gas, gas diver, and maybe at some time they'll make it to a saturation diver. Mm -hmm. so, but, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, as I showed you, there's 43 people. Uh, in the average saturation diving crew on a round of cut, that's about 22 to 23 people per shift. Uh, there may be one, two, uh, or two females in that crew filling position somewhere. Right. Um, Kurt Tidd would like to know, do most of today's saturation divers learn commercial diving first, then develop their skills, such as welding, plumbing, rigging, 
or do they develop the work skills first and then the saturation driving? Well, that, that's a great question, and it, it's uh, uh, it's a mix. It's a mix. Uh, to me, uh, in, in my experience uh, in hiring divers, is that the divers that came into the field with with good construction skills uh, would oftentimes make the best divers. You've got to have that in an in a, in a uh, uh, a mechanical ability uh, or some kind of additional skill. The other thing is, if you've got skills like welding, surface welding, you're going to get more work. They're going to use you on more jobs. So you're going to have more opportunity to graduate through the ranks and be included on more projects. So, uh, yeah, I always say it's good to come in with some good mechanical skills, welding, burning, uh, rigging, uh, 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 concrete construction, all of those, especially for the inland diving community, they're all valuable skills to use. So, but there are, have there been some very successful divers that entered the in industry without a lot of skills and they just learn their skills on the way. A, a commercial diving schools, it's a requirement that every diver uh, spends a minimum of 625 hours of training at a commercial diving uh, school. There's about 13 of them across the country. And uh, uh, so they, acquire the basics there, the very basics of some of these skills. But uh, I think it's the ones that have skills going in that are going to be, uh, 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 have a greater chance of success in the field and making a career of it. Okay, excellent. Um, I've got a couple more I think we can squeeze in. I have, Lisa hasn't chimed in yet. <laughs> um, so from iPad 3, so I don't know who you are, um, what is the science behind the 30-day limit for the commercial saturation project? Sanity of the entrapped divers, question <laughs> mark? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I do. I think it's economics. Uh, you got to, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's economics and it's productivity and it's physiologically as well. So, and psychologically. Uh, uh, the, the divers after 30 days, sometimes they start lo uh, losing their focus. Uh, and but the other thing is, uh, uh, the divers are breathing this gas under pressure, so it's just hard on the body, time after time. So thirty days it just seemed to be the practical limit of when it. Now it's time you get this burnout stage going in, and we even watch the divers working in the water, uh, breathing that that heavier gas after working about three to five hours in the water, their productivity slows way down. Uh, and yeah. so it's time to switch out to divers, and 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 that's just kind of a rule of thumb. There's no legal limit. Uh, the diver they can keep them longer, but it just doesn't seem to work out. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, Mark Allen was, and you kind of touched on it right then at the end. Um, you know, he was looking to see if you could elaborate a bit more on like our additional funding situation for getting the cash lot, which. He asked that early on, so you kind of touched on that a bit more. I don't know if you have any other thoughts. I've, I've had a lot of people mentioning that they, they think we definitely should have it. <laughs> well, good. For, yeah, first, I, you know, uh, besides the funding, I think it's just important uh, for the people here at the museum to know that uh, our members would like to see an exhibit like this out there. And then the funding comes uh, in line. And I don't know if we have anything set up. We can always take donation and, and you can... Uh, you can designate your do, do, uh, donation uh, uh, to be used for uh, the funding of the cash lot system. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, uh, I am very high on this because I, I appreciate how historically significant that is. I just think we're so fortunate to ha that this uh, system is still in existence. Uh, and I think it's a great educational tool uh, uh, you know, for, uh, for our museum to be able to uh, educate all the attendees, uh, all our members and all the people that come here about saturation diving and about this particular system and the role it plays. So, and, and Lisa may be able to comment more about how donations can be made. Uh, but anyway. No, that, that, that makes sense. That, that definitely, you know, that's not quite my area of the museum dynamic, but. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, I do have, well, I think I, cause I know Lisa popped in, so I know that's my cue. Um, <laughs> I do, ha, Let's what get do another you, good one. Let's get another I, good one. 
what do um, you see, what, what, how does, like, what's the visibility or how do they go about visibility issues when you're in 600 feet of water at that well, point? Naturally, you're not going to have the natural light and the visibility is going to be all the things that divers get subjected to, uh, uh, which is anywhere from zero to, you know, it, it may be on a, on a unique circumstance, a hundred foot of visibility uh, or better. Uh, but those are, that's probably unique situations and the divers are perfectly capable in working in zero visibility uh, 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 situations. On our New York project, we, we probably enjoyed uh, at least 20 to 30 foot of visibility. But, you know, all the work was right in front of me. We had a small shaft. Anything over five feet was kind of wasted bits. But uh, uh, at any rate, the divers are, are, are trained to work in whatever it is. So, and a lot of times they may have 100 foot of visibility when they get there, but as soon as they start tromping around on the, on the bottom, working on the pipeline or working on a, a, a wellhead or whatever they're working on, they get stirred up. So you may have, in one dive, you may have a visibility that starts at 100 feet and dwindles away to nothing. So, uh, makes sense. All right. Well, Lisa. Well, thank you, John. That was fascinating. You know, over the years, I've talked to you a lot. I've met some of. The, I've met um, uh, a lot of the guys at underwater intervention and the commercial kind of guys. And, um, you know, it is, it's a fascinating project. It would be a huge asset to the history of diving museum. Um, there is unfortunately a fee for that. And it's probably going to cost about 150 to, you know, maybe 200,000 to bring it from its current home up in New Jersey. Welcome. Down here you got and, and, uh, and, and get it situated. But that being said, um, we're sourcing out grants, we're sourcing out foundations, we're sourcing out sponsorships, and anything that we can get for matching funds can be designated exactly to the cash a lot. Um, my email is director at divingmuseum.org and um, call me and let's discuss it. Let me know if somebody, you know, that you might know of that might be interested in, and we'll just go from there. That's all. We can have a conversation and see what we can do about moving it forward. But it is a huge asset. And uh, John, thank you. That was a very great presentation. We appreciate your work on the board. We appreciate your work in the commercial diving field and, and everything you do. We have a, it, John is a, a proud card carrying member at the History of Diving Museum. So again, I encourage you all that are out there and listening that if you're a member, that's great. Invite a friend. If you're not a member, become a member because uh, you can be part of a great community and a great project like this. So with that, I think we're going to um, sign off. We're gonna have this up on a recording, up on our YouTube channel. We have a thank you gift for, um, for John. And next month we'll be talking about our 15 year anniversary and all the things that the Bowers did, their collections and opening up this uh, great facility and how it's changed over the time um, that we've been in Isla Mirada. So thank you everybody, dive in soon. Yes, thank you everyone and have a good evening. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.